Thank you very much. Uh, is, is the mic working there? Can you, can you all hear me properly? Um, I'm going to put the lights down a bit so that we can see the image. Or not. <laughs> all right, anyway, I'll carry on. Um, yes, so thank you all for coming. Um, I just thought I'd go through uh, where I started, which was working traditionally in acrylics, mainly for publishing. I've actually brought this painting in, if any of you want to look at it, it's down there. Um, this was the kind of thing I used to do back in the day. Uh, and this was before Photoshop. Or, uh, work, the way we work digitally now was science fiction when I started working. Uh, and so there was a big demand for kind of very photographic, um, realistic imagery long before Photoshop. So this was done in, in acrylics using a variety of different masks uh, to create the effect. That's a, a close-up of it. And the way I, I used to get this effect was um, I would use an airbrush, uh, I'd paint a lot of the background in with a, a paintbrush, um, and then uh, using something like a rubber solution mask uh, to flick on with a toothbrush, and then spray some more colour on it, wipe the rubber solution off, and that would leave little white highlights, and then I'd go in with a paintbrush and meticulously work in the pores uh, to get the skin texture. Um, this was a, a book called A Tupa Left Too Far by Brian Aldiss. And I used to share, rent studio space from the photographers. And one of the photographers there got very interested in what I was doing and he ended up posing for a lot of book covers. In fact, most of the people I knew at that time ended up on a book cover in one form or another. Uh, but I used to go to a lot of trouble back in those days. So I made little um, balsa wood tusks for his cheeks and uh, I made the bird out of cardboard and wire um, and then photograph the whole thing. I'll show you the process, which is very kind of time consuming. Um, photograph the whole thing and then work from the photographs, uh, again, working in acrylics. Um, this was, uh, she should actually have a bright red dress on. But the colour seems to have gone out of it a bit. Um, this was uh, Jack Womack, cyberpunk novel. And she was the secretary who worked at the photographers at the time, so she got roped into this job. Uh, but I painted this in a slightly different way in that um, the background, the buildings, I just put in as a black silhouette and then taking a very fine brush, um, I just worked from dark to light and built up the foreground textures and, uh, until I got it to where it needed to be. So I never really settled on a technique that I was happy with. I was always experimenting uh, and trying to come up with different ways of doing it. I did a series of books based on the Doomsday Warrior uh, and this was probably at the time of Rambo, so heavily muscled characters were all in vogue and very popular. There's quite a funny story attached to this one because, as I say, I used to rent studio space from the photographers. Uh, I had a girlfriend who lived next door to the photographers, and she had a three-storey house, and at the top, the loft space was empty. And I couldn't always get into the studio because the photographers were busy, so sometimes I would use her loft space. Um, so I've got a local guy from the local gym. Um, I got him into the uh, space up there and um, stripped him down and sprayed him with water so he was nice and sweaty and shiny looking and gave him some plastic guns. And then I realised that I'd left one of the guns behind. So I ran out of the house to the studio, grabbed this plastic gun and ran back again. So, so up the stairs doing the photography. First of all, the phone started to ring, uh, which I ignored because it wasn't my house. So it obviously wasn't going to be for me. And then there was a horrendous banging on the door. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to go and to that. So I went down the two flights of stairs. And as I got to the bottom, the door was open and two enormous policemen were coming in. And I could see police cars coming up, drawing up on the outside. These were more instant times. I dread to think what would have happened now. And what had happened, of course, is somebody had seen me run out of the studio with a plastic gun and had rung the police. And so they descended on the place. And the phone call was from one of the photographers, Roger, uh, and they went to the photographers and said, somebody's just been seen coming out of this building with a gun. And he said, that's oh, just Fred, he's doing some shooting. So <laughs> we backed up the stairs until we got to the top and there was this heavily muscled guy, all looking sweaty, uh, bedecked with straps, so it was some, somewhat embarrassing all around. So this was 3D back in the day for me. Um, I used to make up uh, models, scratch kits, using... Whatever I could find, I used to haunt the uh, local um, pharmacy looking for interesting shaped um, shampoo bottles. 
And so the spaceship on the right there was, the uh, basic body of it was a shampoo bottle. And then the engines were from an A-10 attack craft from an Apex kit. The tower in the middle was made up out of bits of cardboard. The egg-shaped part was um, the shrink wrap that goes around Easter eggs. Uh, the whole thing was sprayed up with metal paint. And then that got used uh, in two paintings that I did, which for the Isaac Asimov Foundation um, saga. Uh, and this was divided up into six covers, but I couldn't paint it in one go. Um, a, because I couldn't find a piece of board big enough, and B, strongly suspected that it wouldn't survive the journey uh, down to London. So what I did was carried on uh, spraying onto a separate bit of card, and then sent the first painting down, and then with the, using the separate bit of card uh, to match the colours, I carried on. So you can see this in the spaceship in the middle there is the shampoo bottle with the A10 engines attached to it. And more recently, uh, there's been some interest in foundation anyway, but uh, people have approached me and wanted a print of the whole thing. So I put it together in Photoshop. So now the entire image exists as uh, one image. Yeah. It was a very time consuming process. Again, airbrushed all the little lights uh, on the dark side of the planet were put in with uh, a technical pen with ink in it. So I just, like, dotted every single light in. Uh, and it was, it, the deadline was really tight. I had uh, two weeks to do each bit. Um, and so it was basically a question of working from 8 in the morning till 10, 11, midnight, until I couldn't stay awake any longer to, um, to get, get it all done. Uh, it felt like I'd been released from prison when I was finally got the thing done and um, got it on the train down to London. I did actually sell both of these paintings to different people. And the guy that bought the left-hand side, sorry, the guy that bought the right-hand side wanted the left-hand side. And of course, I didn't have it because I sold it to somebody else. But actually, I didn't sell it. I swapped it with another illustrator at, one, at a convention. He had one of mine. He took this and I had one of his. So I got to paint that again for my sins. So the way this used to happen back in the day is they would send me a manuscript. Uh, this is unheard of. Today they would send, a, uh, it basically might even just be a paragraph, it would be a brief. And some, some art director and publishers would probably send me an image as well and say, this is what it's supposed to look like. But back then, um, so much stuff was going through. You were given a lot of freedom to do what you wanted which was good and bad because you had to read these manuscripts. Not all of them were wonderful to read. So then I would do um, a rough, in this case it's in acrylics on a piece of stretched cartridge paper. Uh, I would wet that, stick it on the board, put the tape around the edge, and as the paper dried it would go really nice and tight. And then I'd paint on that and do a colour rough, which I would send to the publishers. And of course, before email or anything like that, it physically had to go in the post. and take two or three days before the art director would ring me up and give me approval or not. So then again, <laughs> before digital photography, uh, I would go into the studio where I was saying I was renting studio space, get the model in, do the photography, do a contact sheet, which is the thing in the middle. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the dark room because uh, there were twins in this image. The same girl could pose for both characters. So this is also proof that I used to have hair at one time. Um, but this is uh, the 3D part of it, so th there's going to be a boat in this. So I got a, a kit and customised it and sat it on a piece of aluminium foil to get the reflections. And then uh, with airbrushing, um, you need to have various masks. There were hard masks that would give you a sharp edge, soft masks, which were paper masks. And a lot of airbrush artists then used to um, use acetate because it didn't buckle, it would get wet, it didn't buckle, but the danger with acetate was that the paint would just lie on the surface, so it was really easy to wipe the paint off and smudge the surface. But this stuff was um, prints that the photographers had discarded, and they used to have really big ones. And it was great because I could take uh, something like a compass point and scribe a really intricate shape with it and snap it out, uh, and it would get wet, um, but it wouldn't buckle, but it was... Um, sufficiently absorbent that the paint didn't lie on the surface. So it was perfect for the job, really. And then the uh, frisk film, which was like a plastic film that you put down on the board, which turned out to be laboriously cut out with a scalpel, which was an art in itself, because if you cut too far, you would damage the board and you would never 
be able to hide the mark. So I put the background in with a big airbrush. Um, you can see that I've cut some little um, paper masks for the characters' hair, so I've got a soft edge around the hair. And then, I'm sorry about the quality of these, by the way, they're old 35mm slides, so um, the quality isn't brilliant. Um, but uh, I'm using a smaller airbrush to just airbrush the highlights in. So all the masks have gone now, the background's gone in. You can see there are hard edges where I've used the plastic film with soft edges around the, the girl's hair. Um, and then I would mask off the bits uh, with paper. The top left there, you can see the photograph of the, the boat that I used as a reference that I was building earlier. Um, that's the very contrast to these is actually more detail uh, in the shadows than you can see. Um, but that's the whole of the background in, and we're ready to start on the characters. So using the reference that uh, I took, I would literally go in with a, a small sable brush and just cross-hatch the painting. I could spend a whole day just painting on two square inches of this picture, you know, just trying to get the head right. And that's how the whole thing finished up. This was The Winds of Stratos by David Brin, if I remember correctly. In fact, I've just sold that painting. There's uh, quite a market for these old paintings still. I've got an agent in Washington who specialises in selling them. So then along came the computer. And the story about this, I was really busy for years. Uh, and I'd, I'd always had 10 or 15 jobs up ahead, and I, they're all stacked up at the back of the studio. Uh, and I was so busy, I never really noticed that the number of jobs was diminishing until one day it was like running off the edge of a cliff full tilt. There were no more jobs. And I couldn't understand what was happening. And somebody gave me a magazine. Uh, and in this magazine were images produced by a bit of software called Bryce. How many of you have heard of Bryce? Oh, well, well done. Because it's interesting that this was cutting edge at the time, and now it's obsolete. <laughs> Hardly anybody can uh, remember what it is. Anyway, Bryce was one of the first bits of software, and it was cheap as well. And it, you could produce these um, amazing-looking landscapes, or so they appeared at the time. It was very kind of basic, ray-traced, hard ray-traced, but it was astonishing at the time. And so I thought, that's it. Computers. Uh, I need to get on the computer bandwagon. I'm being left behind. Um, which wasn't true, actually. What was happening is that the publishers had decided that science fiction imagery, which is where I was specialising, really, uh, was ghettoising book covers. And it was only appealing to Star Wars and Star Trek fans, and they wanted to broaden the scope. And so, because Photoshop by this time had arrived, they could do a lot of stuff themselves. And they started doing very simple covers uh, with silver type, just black cover, to try and appeal to a broader audience. But I didn't know that. And so I thought, I'm going to have to get on this bandwagon. But I, I knew nothing at all about computers. Um, and I had a friend who'd got a basic Power Mac. And so I, I bought a Power Mac 6300. I think it's got eight megabytes, not gigabytes. It's got eight megabytes of RAM in it. And I bought Bryce and Photoshop and a bit of uh, 3D software called Alias Sketch which morphed into Maya some years later. Uh, and this was the first morning that I got the computer set up. I had to get a friend in to show me how to switch it off and switch it on because I had no clue. And I sat down with the manual and produced an image of an infinite sea with a silver ball floating in the sky, and I thought it was absolutely amazing. Uh, and this was for a, a local sound company that I, I did in Bryce, using an extrusion for the lettering and the, the great chromium balls. So then I went on um, to try and do more digital stuff, but it turned out that rather than being left behind, I was actually ahead. And the publishers didn't know what to do with the digital images. With the digital image, the printers didn't know how to print them, and the results were pretty horrible. And they, they, stu they were still expecting a painting. So I started to use the uh, 3D stuff, run prints out and use that as reference, and then do paintings from them. But eventually, the rest of the industry caught up, and um, I was able to do digital uh, images, give them digital files. Um, and this, in a way, reinvented me because I was one of the first people to start doing this. And so suddenly the work had dropped off, and for two or three years it picked up again because I'd got a new look. Uh, and I did a series of books for Battletech uh, for the States. I did something like four of these covers every year for about six years. And I, I cut, all my, cut my digital teeth, basically, on these covers, learned how to UV, map, how to model. This was all done in Lightwave, um, because uh, Alias Sketch had turned into Maya, as I said. But when it initially did that, it would only run on silicon graphics machines, which were 20 grand 
back in the 1990s, so there's no way. So I've got to, have to find something else. So Lightwave was the thing that I moved on to. Most of these designs were, well, all of the robot designs were designed by the company FASA at the time. And so they would send me line drawings and I would build the models from that. Or sometimes they would send me little action figures which were a couple of inches high and more on, on that later. I went to more trouble than necessary really, but I was kind of so engrossed in the whole thing, UVing, building. And I, what I found was that doing it virtually was pretty much the same as what I'd been doing previously with the plastic kits, but with less mess. So after a while, they decided that they wanted figures that battling robots was getting a bit old. So they wanted some figures put in. So this is the way I used to do that. As you can see, there was no expense spared, hairdryer for the ray gun down in the bottom right, and a, a plastic gun with a cardboard tube on it. And that's how that ended up. The background's all lightwave, um, and the guns are all um, lightwave. Obviously, uh, she was heavily worked on in Photoshop. Uh, and the rubble she's standing on was some junk that the photographers had thrown out and were just lying around outside the studio. And as I say, they used to, uh, sometimes they would send me these little action figures. So instead of building the thing in Lightwave, I photographed the little action figures and then took them into Photoshop and worked over them. But it was almost as laborious to try and, because these things would have uh, mold marks and all sorts of uh, imperfections in the plastic. And it almost took me as long to paint all that out in Photoshop um, as it did to build the models. So this is an example of, um, this was for a book by Charles Stross called Neptune's Brood. Uh, and there's no 3D at all in this, it's all Photoshop. And the way I created these shapes um, was to create a custom brush in Photoshop and then set the parameters um, so it would randomly scatter the shapes. Uh, I found a bit of architecture on the net and then turned it into black and white. And then um, you'd, I'd get, I got Photoshop to scatter the shapes and then divided it in two and mirrored it. And as soon as you do that, it turns into something. It could be a face. In this case, it was a spaceship. I did the same thing, actually, for the asymmetrical ones at the bottom. And then just worked on it in Photoshop. Uh, the brief was, for this was a gigantic spaceship underwater. So there you go. That's what we got. Whoops. These are some more recent covers um, for Diane Chapman and uh, I can't remember the name of the author now. But it was Mike, Mike Chapman was the guy anyway. <coughs> and um, he, he wanted uh, these. I, I started off designing this um, guy, so it, it was much more high tech. But the author wanted something that looked a bit more thrown together and a bit more archaic, so that's why the outfits look like that. And the great thing about doing stuff in 3D is that once you've got the model, you can then reuse it in the next um, job. So it might take quite a bit of time um, to build the, the model initially, but then the subsequent co covers become quicker <coughs> and easier. Incidentally, both that one, that was based on um, a painting by Frank Rosetta. Any of you know Frank Rosetta? A painting called Bran MacMorn, which is... Um, got a horde of barbarians coming over a, a hill. So that's what inspired me to, for that composition. And this was a, a wire painting of a couple of um, First World War soldiers. Uh, and that inspired, they were standing in a wreck building in France, I think. Um, so <coughs> that inspired uh, the composition for that image. Uh, and that's one of the covers with the type on. So they did quite a good job with the type. Excuse me a sec while I have a drink. So uh, <clears throat> a couple of years ago we were in Anglesey and there's a long pier there out, and we walked out to the end of this pier and there was this rusty piece of metal which I thought was quite interesting and I thought the textures on that looked just like some kind of alien planet or Mars something like that. So it ended up the background for this image. Um, by this time, I'd moved into Modo, which is a bit of 3D software that I, I use a lot now. This is just a personal image. And it also ended up as the texture on the background of, um, of that one as well. 
uh, the texture on the gas giant planet was actually started off as a photograph of uh, a loaf of bread that the bread maker baked and it was full of, again it looked more like a cratered planet but by the time I'd taken it into Photoshop and used Liquify on it, it looked more like a gas giant planet. So it's, it's interesting where you can, you can find these uh, textures and they can be inspiration um, for creating these images. And this image <coughs> started off as uh, a discussion on Facebook where there is a structure in Saturn's rings which is literally um, a million miles high and somebody said it might be a good subject for a painting. And so I did this ring miner image which was the start of a bunch of ring miner images that I did because I got fascinated by the whole idea. I think the actual structure in Saturn's rings is more part particulate. It's not these giant fanciful rocks that I painted, but it made for a, a good image. And to get the asteroids in the bottom, um, <clears throat> Modo has got uh, quite a good facility called replicators where you can create a bunch of little anything really, rocks in this case, and then it will, uh, if you create a vertex cloud, it will randomly scatter these shapes along that vertex cloud. Uh, and to get this sense of perspective, I actually used a physical model trick by making the rocks smaller and bringing the perspective in uh, artificially rather than trying to actually have you know, an infinite perspective, which would be very difficult to do. <clears throat> and it's much more controllable this way, but it gives you the same kind of effect. And a lot of uh, physical modelers for films will do that. They'll build um, a model uh, and then they'll cheat the perspective so that from one camera angle it looks much bigger than it actually is. This was another one in the same series. As I say, I got quite fascinated with the idea of the ring miners, so I did a whole bunch of images. <clears throat> and the final one, I got the idea that this was almost like a basking shark sailing through the rings of some gas giant, sucking in lumps of ice at one end and refining it, which is why the ship has got looks a bit like a a refinery. There's a lot of Photoshop work on top of the 3D to get to that. Um, around 2000, um, I got uh, an email from John Davis, who was directing uh, Jimmy Neutron in the States. And because, as I was saying, I was considered the kind of digital pioneer, and I'd <clears throat> gone from traditional to digital, and I was one of the first ones to be working digital in publishing. Um, a guy called Dick Judah decided he had been commissioned by Harper Collins to do a book and he ch the subject matter was going to be traditional to digital because we were living through that transition phase at the time. And so because I was the digital pioneer, he uh, got in touch with me and said, do you want to be in this book? So I said, well, yeah, of course. So I was in, at the end, the digital bit, and the upshot of this was that one of the traditional artists showed the book to John Davis and there was just something about my work that appealed to him, so I got an email from him out of the blue saying, did I want to work on Jimmy Neutron, which I did remotely. And then Jimmy Neutron was a success for them, and so Tom Hanks approached him and asked him to make the Ant Bully film, and so he got back in touch with me, so I got to work on the Ant Bully. And I ended up travelling out to Texas and working for a year and a half on this in Texas, flying back and forth, which was quite good fun. Um, some of the early character designs, just pencil drawings, to come up with the intake characters. Uh, we had to come up with a design for the interior of the ant's nest, which was supposed to look organic and earth-like, but also have a sense of design about it. And we went through a lot of iterations um, until I did this, and then they all, they all loved this idea, and these became known as the Gambino condos. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this film. Um, it didn't do as well as Jimmy Neutron for them. But there's, there's a, a moment in it where the ant bully floods the ant's nest and tidal waves of water rush through. So this was my concept for that moment as the water runs through and starts trashing the interior of the nest. Uh, there's a moment where the, uh, the wasps attack um, or raid the ant's caterpillar farms. And apparently this, this is what happens. The ants do farm the caterpillars and the wasps do raid them. Uh, and so they incorporated that into the movie. And that was my concept of that. A lot of, again, a lot of this is lightweight, the models of the... Um, and funnily, at the time, I was one of the few people, the few concept artists, that could use 3D. So again, the, getting on that 3D bandwagon early really helped me. There's a, a moment in the film that didn't make it into the film where the, the nursery was popping little baby ants out. And to get this effect, I built the towers using chicken wire 
which I then sprayed um, cavity wall insulation foam into uh, and got it into a kind of the right kind of shape and then I took that into Photoshop and distorted it even more and obviously painted the atmospheric parts of it. It's another idea that ma didn't make it into the film. Um, I thought it would be cool if the, because all the ants, these are designed by the character designer by this time, um, they're all wearing tribal paint and I thought it would be cool if when you first saw the ant elders all you saw was the glowing paint and then the lights would come up and you'd they'd be revealed for what they are, which was an idea that they all loved, but didn't make it into the film. And then Lucas, the, the small child that gets shrunk down to the size of an ant, and um, that has his adventures there. When he first appears in the ant's nest, he's naked, um, so he has to make up uh, his costume, and he starts off with just a leaf and some cobwebs, and as the film progresses, his outfit becomes more and more cool, until at the very end, he's got this you know, super-duper... Uh, battle armour made out of old insect parts. Um, some of the right wing in America got very upset about the fact that the little boy was naked in a child's film. There you go. And this was the, uh, the wizard ant, Zock. Um, he had to have a lab somewhere. And so this was my concept for that. You see the Gambino condos on either side of it. Uh, and it's in a route. <coughs> Did a... Um, did this for a matte painting actually, but in the end they, did, they didn't get used as matte paintings because they were making it for the IMAX as well and there was some issues, so they had to build it all in 3D in the end. So I did some work for Epic Mickey um, a few years ago as well. I don't know if any of you played that game. It's um, one of my first forays into doing game concept art. Uh, and the concept here is that a lot of discarded Disney characters that were thrown in the dumpster at the back of the Disney lot fall through some kind of wormhole and all exist in some other universe. Um, and the main villain uh, lived in this castle which is in a solvent sea, so the bottom part of the castle is all kind of dissolved away. And they needed a vehicle to sail on the solvent sea, <coughs> so this was my idea for that, which is, and obviously these are all Disney parts, the, uh, the whale from um, Pinocchio, and you can see Mickey's hand operating the paddle wheel. Of course, the paddle wheel is iconic uh, for Disney as well, and bits of Disney Expo. And there were the characters, uh, they call them beetle works, and they were made up out of Disney characters, again, discarded in the dump. So a bit like um, the zombies. So this is my zombie Goofy. <coughs> and there's a, an art of epic Mickey, and at the beginning of that, one of the producers says that when she saw this image, they knew they'd got something special. But interestingly, none of the illustrators got a credit in that book. Um, there were several of us in there, not, despite the fact that it was something special. So a few years back, this film came out called Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't know if you remember that one. Uh, and I ended up working at Framestore in London uh, on their sequence. Framestore had been assigned... Um, the sequence of uh, Nowhere, the giant alien school. Uh, so they had to design the interior of that. Uh, and the brief was to come up with something that didn't look like the, uh, the Death Star, basically. So we sat down and we designed all these various landing platforms. The other thing, uh, you can't really see it on there, but there are these red markings um, where it looks grey on the screen. It should actually be bright red, because we were trying to give it a kind of 70s feel. Um, which obviously uh, was the nostalgia of the film. So a lot of this stuff was just kit-bashed. Uh, we just took bits of models from anywhere and just jammed them together until we found shapes that started to look interesting. There was a sequence that didn't really make it into the film um, where they were mining this yellow gunk, and so we had to do a design for the mining complex, and these were designs for the various um, parts of the mining facility. And then... We turned it into this um, piece of concept art. It's interesting that just about, uh, I kind of put the basics down for this, and then in the end, everybody in the art department had a go at it, so I can't really say that it's my concept art anymore because we, we all worked on it in the end. But you can see at the back there is the, uh, the mining um, towers that were in the previous. That's one of the towers that I designed in the foreground. It was amazing, we spent three months working on this, 
and uh, I'm sure you've seen the movie, the sequence goes past in about half a second. You really can't see. I mean, I can see what we've done because I know what we've done, but anybody can do it, right? It's, you can't believe that you spent all that time working on it. Uh, and in a similar vein, I worked on Thor Ragnarok, also for frame still. Uh, and the brief we, we had here, we, we had to um, try and give a Jack Kirby feel. Again, it's somewhat desaturated on the screen, but if you're familiar with Jack Kirby's work, it was very bright graphic uh, colours. And they wanted to try and give it that feel but make it realistic, which is sometimes difficult, especially with reds, because reds tend to jump forward and you, you lose the scale. So the big tower in the middle in the arena on the right-hand side there was designed by Weta, but um, I got to do all the other stuff um, in Modo. And then the textures and the colours we applied over the top. We also had to come up with some idea for what the wormholes in the sky were going to look like. Um, and this was uh, the design for the bit where Thor first arrives and lands in the junkyard. Um, <clears throat> and again, using replicators in Modo, I could... Uh, create a folder of junk and then Modo will scatter it about randomly for me so that saved a lot of time but I'll give you a, a detail of what that looked like um, I worked at uh, a games company for a while in, uh, and in the mornings we used to do 20 minute speed paint exercises which uh, were a lot of fun and I would recommend to anybody and we each, um, took it in turns every morning to come up with a subject and then we had 20 minutes to to do it however we wanted to do it. The rules were that you couldn't um, use, actually use photographs. You could use photographs as a reference, but you couldn't actually put the photographs in the image. Um, I think the subject for this was Leviathan, and uh, this was the same Photoshop brush scatter technique that I used for that image earlier. The good thing about this is that in 20 minutes you haven't got any time to think about it. So basically the first idea that you come up with is what you end up with. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's not very clear on there, but um, Day of the Dead was that one, it's a fairly obvious solution. That one was called Floating, and probably my favourite one. The eyes have disappeared. It's funny, I, on this screen there are no reds, so this has actually got red eyes, but you can't see them. That one's Cougar. So I'll just finish up with um, my own personal project, which is called Dark Shepherd, that I've been working on for a while. Um, I thought I'd start big and design the thing as a, a movie poster. But uh, I'd show um, my technique digitally in com compared to what I used to do back in the day. But uh, I, some of this was just uh, to test out new uh, or test out modeling workflow in, in Modo. And I just wanted to build as complicated a model as possible. It's one of the vehicles in the story. Um, so obviously there's a lot of unnecessary work. You wouldn't do this as a, for a concept piece, but I just wanted to do it just to the sheer fun of building it. Uh, that's the kind of detail in the cockpit. Uh, and there are these giant machines in the story which break up obsolete spaceships. And again, this was a similar thing. I just wanted to build as complex a model as I could. So even down, this is just one model. So even in the cab, we've got the operator and the controls uh, down to the first aid kit on the back door, on the back wall, sorry, and the concertina door at the back. Um, so and just run, this is the what we're, we're aiming for. The, sorry, I'm getting a bit of a crick neck. Um, so I'd start off doing something really basic. I actually did this rough after the fact, but um, this is what I might do, just co to just come up with a simple compositional idea. And then I needed a design for the spacecraft, so I was scrolling the internet and I saw this small image, it was like a thumbnail, which I thought looked quite interesting. Uh, and so zooming in, it turned out to be a couple of wrecked tanks. So I took that into Photoshop and painted over the top of it and ended up with that design, which I quite liked. Uh, and then went ahead and built the thing in 3D. Um, and then I created an entire scene, which I'll show you at the very end but these are separate renders from that scene so we've got the concrete apron that it lands on uh, some mountains from but these were photographs I took in Canada and they're actually in the scene on cards um, the advantage of doing that is that Modo will create all the local color the environment color goes into the mountains it just makes it look more convincing it saves me having to think about it 
That was one of the habitat rings in the sky. Using meadows replicators to replicate junk um, and the spaceship itself, done in various colours. And I'll explain why in a sec. So here it is all in all the in Photoshop. On the right hand side you can see all the different layers there, so all those different elements are sat on different layers. Um, this bit started to colour the vehicle in in the background, put some mist in there. Um, so, whoops. That's the grey render on top of the uh, lighter render. Uh, and then using a layer mask, just painting out the bits that I don't want. So the advantage of that is you've got all the highlights and the colour, uh, and you can just create the shapes with just a single brush stroke. Uh, oops. So there, I'm just dirtying it all down. I think that may be the, the last one. All right. That's yeah, that's the, the final image with all the dirt and uh, Photoshop um, textures applied. So just recently, I've gone full circle and I've gone back to painting in oils. But um, I don't want to paint in that laborious, very tight way that I used to. I mean, the airbrush was the work of the devil. I never want to use an airbrush ever again. I sold all my airbrush stuff about 15 years ago. Um, what I'm trying to do is develop a new, looser style. So you can see when you zoom into that, it is pretty loose. Uh, but it's quite um, refreshing to paint this way. You don't have to worry too much about getting everything absolutely accurate. It's all about the feel and the atmosphere. Uh, and I did a, this is a, a digital image that I turned into a painting. So the way I would do that now is to transfer that to um, a piece of acrylic paper, in this case, and then put all the blacks in and then fill it in. And that was uh, my design for an ornithopter, which I did before the movie came out. Um, so, yeah, so that's it. That's the final image.